All right, well, welcome everyone. We're one minute past the start time, so we'll just get started here and I'll I'll fill it with the fun stuff before we get to the, the meat of our presentation. But welcome to uh, our corporate engagement uh, webinar here on how can my portfolio impact trends in corporate America. It's a hot, hot topic nowadays um, and uh, it's getting a lot of attention. We have some exciting things to share today and a very special guest, um, Jerry Boyer. I'll tell you a little bit about Jerry here shortly. Um, Chris Lim and I will be co-hosting uh, to share this, and this is presented by the Nashville Ronald Blue Trust office. So for those of you that got invited, I'm sure you are somehow connected or, or know someone on our team. Chris, do you want to go to the next slide? Now, a couple of reminders as we go through this. Um, this is a recording, so if you really enjoy it, want to watch it again, uh, we'll get you a recording uh, if you have anyone that would be interested in this or find the topic useful, uh, we'll pass that along. There will be a Q&A at the end, so you can um, give us your best questions or clarify anything that may or may not um, make sense. And uh, you can just give Jerry your hardest questions. Um, however, we do want to give you a note uh, that um, Jerry is an author. He's written a wonderful book called The Maker and the Takers. Uh, just got myself a copy. Really enjoy it. For whoever asked the best question, we'll let Jerry determine who that is. Um, we will mail you a copy of his book. So make sure at the end, uh, if you do win that, um, provide us with your email or something so we can get in contact with you. So Jerry Boyers from Boyer Research Group, um, great author, wonderful book. I don't know if you have a favorite, favorite economist. Uh, I do, and it happens to be Jerry. <clears throat> Very entertaining, uh, a brilliant guy, and not to try to sell his book to you, but uh, I just wanted to put this in perspective, might plant a seed. It blew my mind this weekend. So have you ever thought about the economics in the Bible? And I'll start off with this. Uh, have you ever thought about what the economy was in the city of Bethlehem, right? Or what did they do for work? Well, thanks to Jerry's research, we found out that uh, in Bethlehem, they were shepherds and they raised lambs. They raised sheep, right? Now, they didn't raise sheep just to sell them. They raised them purely for sacrificial slaughter in Jerusalem. So you heard that right. Where our Savior, Jesus, was born, Son of Man, Son of God, was born in a city that produced sheep to be sent off for sacrificial slaughter. So if you want to learn more about those things, pick up Jerry's book. Um, uh, that's my that's my uh, my little teaser for his book there. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our Nashville team, we're growing, just like Nashville is, our team is growing uh, very rapidly. Here's some of the guys on our team um, that you probably, you may not know me, you may not know Chris, um, but one of these guys probably invited you um, to this presentation today. Um, if you want to learn more, there's a little QR code there you can scan and learn a little bit about our Nashville team and our office here. Now, this is becoming a more reoccurring thing. We're trying to put out as much resources as we can out there to, to educate those, to have some fun events. Um, some of you joined us probably for the Tin Pan South Songwriters Round uh, on March 30th, really great time. If you didn't, uh, join us next year. Um, every quarter, we put out a newsletter just to kind of give you our thoughts around the economy outlook. Um, so that just came out. Chris and I co-penned uh, a 2022 Christmas edition uh, year-end high net worth tax planning guide. If you're interested, you can snap that QR code. Um, maybe some of you attended, I think it was last month, we did an investment webinar on um, filling the gap in your investment portfolio with private investments. And then last year, we did a recession, volatility, and inflation webinar. Uh, any interest in seeing those, you can uh, click on those QRs, scan those QRs, pick up your phone, and you can watch those. Um, another thing, we have a great podcast at Ron Blue, the Wisdom for Wealth for Life podcast. Um just to highlight one of them, uh, Jerry's been on one recently. You can hear from him and our CEO, Nick Stone Street. I did one with uh, Dr. Chris and Elisa Grace on suiting your marriage and finance. Um, feel free to take a look at that and be encouraged. A couple of things coming ahead. So if you really like this um, or if you don't and you want to find out a different one that you enjoy, um, we have another webinar coming up uh, this fall for Wisdom for Parents on how to not ruin your children financially. Uh, in person, we have a few events, um, <clears throat> Wisdom for Institutions, that will actually on it, that will be a webinar as well, uh, just talking about institutional investments and employer retirement plans for Christian institutions. 
Uh, in August, in person, backed by popular demand, we'll have a Wisdom for Marriage event with Dr. Chris and Elisa Grace as well on how to build spiritual, emotional, and financial intimacy. So uh, really excited for that. We'll be at a, actually a historic, iconic venue in Nashville. Um, and we'll also, for those business owners, in the fall, we'll have a Wisdom for Business event on the topic of succession, significance, and success. So if you're interested in that, um, you may have seen it when you registered that you could have clicked to show your interest, but we can get you more information um, so you can get connected. So I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, uh, my partner in crime, the guy that trained me when I first got here, uh, Chris Lim. Thanks, Colby. It's good to hear you. Can you guys hear me all right? Awesome. Well, thanks, Colby, for giving us that flyby. Jerry, um, it's good to see you again. I know we've had a number of conversations leading up today. So thanks for making yourself available to us and our clients. My pleasure. It's an honor. Thanks for having me. I um, I think, you know, Jerry, you had some good advice. On a webinar format like this, it's not always helpful to flip through slides. And so I am going to turn off the slides in just a minute. But I think just to set the table for the rest of our time, um, just kind of want to get some thoughts out there and then kind of we'll just be walking through a conversation uh, that I want to facilitate. But um, today's focus, as you probably know from reading the invitation, is on uh, this idea of corporate engagement. And so when I think about the goal for all of our attendees or those who might be listening to the recording sometime in the future, um, the goal of this webinar is really just to share a tool that Ronald Blue Trust is using that is allowing investors to not only winsomely, but also, and most importantly, effectively engage with the companies that they own. I think most investors don't think that they're owners of companies or shareholders. They kind of just think, oh, I get a return, um, and that's really all I care about. But I think more and more investors are beginning to ask a new set of questions alongside performance and allocation and everything else. And that's questions like, is it possible to own an investment without compromising our beliefs? Or what happens when the companies that I own in my portfolio do or say things that are contrary to my beliefs? Or maybe lastly, can my portfolio in fact impact trends in corporate America? If it can, how and to what effect? I think those are the questions that we're beginning to get more and more from investors. Um, and I think before we dive into that topic, I think it's helpful to, to maybe just kind of explain where our firm has been and just give you some background there. So I think our advisors and our firm really at large has always seen themselves to be managers, but not leaders. Um, I've often told clients that when they engage us, when we get the privilege of serving them, I never want them to abdicate leadership, but I want them to be able to delegate responsibility because it's our clients who are the stewards, but they do lean on us to manage their finances. Uh, oftentimes we use the analogy that we're the quarterback uh, or maybe the personal CFO for a family. We, our goal is to, to make money a non-issue, kind of coordinate their whole financial life. But Ron Blue, and our whole firm has kind of always emphasized this issue of stewardship, I'll call it, kind of more on personal decision making. Um, the bedrock verse for our firm comes out of 1 Timothy, and hopefully most of our clients know it. It's chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. It says, instruct those who are rich in this world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but to fix their hope on God who supplies all things for our enjoyment. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, therefore storing up for themselves a foundation for the life that is to come. So we've kind of always emphasized this issue of stewardship, not necessarily on portfolio management, um, but we've acknowledged principles that scripture speaks to, things like God owns it all, um, asking questions, how much is enough, encouraging them to establish financial finish lines so that they could consider being radically generous. Um, our hope for clients in the planning arena has always been, we wanna enable our clients to develop conviction while avoiding prescription. 
I'll say that again. We want to enable conviction while avoiding prescription because God never told me what to do with my client's money in terms of how should they give it away? Um, what kind of home should they buy? And so I think that is important because I think that sort of sets the tone for our conversation today, which is we've never been in the business of telling our clients exactly how to live, where to give. Of course, we want to be a resource. We have some ideas, but ultimately we trust that God is essentially directing them. Um, and at the same time, when it comes to this topic of investments, there's definitely had to be some nuance because we are managers for our clients. And they expect us to have some sort of intentionality and idea of where their funds are being invested. Um, but here's the nuance, and this will basically set the, the conversation up. We live in a fallen world. There is no perfect company. And so from clients, we have a little bit of a dual mandate from some clients. Clients have varying convictions. Um, while while one, one client might have an issue with one company, another client might not share that issue. So we have to sometimes honor those convictions for our clients. But legally speaking, as a fiduciary, our clients trust us to help them accomplish their goals. And from a portfolio management standpoint, that really speaks to allocation, performance, and ultimately using those funds to help them accomplish what they feel like God has laid on their hearts. So the dual mandate is, hey, I want you to give us return in a diversified portfolio, but I also want you to help me live out my convictions. And so that's where access portfolios, which is what we want to talk about today, kind of enters the picture. See, in recent years, we as a firm have been able to develop technology in partnership with other firms and partners. Really, that kind of allows clients to, to meet that dual purpose, right? Of course, they care about what their the returns are, but also many clients want to speak out. Um, and so the access portfolio to help those that are listening understand is just one tool or one strategy that we have among many. And I'll lay out some distinctives of it. Um, not only is it a tool that allows us to engage corporations, um, but it gets us, it gets our client access, I would say greater access than they had before. And it does that in, in really one way. Whereas most strategies would employ sort of mutual funds or index funds, um, the access portfolio essentially allows an investor to take individual holdings. That means you actually own shares of the company. Now you're probably saying, well, I do own shares, but I own them through my funds. And that's the distinction. When you buy a basket of stocks, you do own a large amount of companies, but you don't have necessarily a say. And so Gary, Jerry's going to help me unpack this with you. But one of the distinctives is just greater access. And so what we want to focus on today is how does the access portfolio and the tools at Ronald Blue Trust allow us that sort of access to live out those convictions? But I don't want to miss another reason that most of our clients often use these. Uh, because they're held you're holding individual stocks, you have some advantages. And I'll speak to just two of them real quickly. The first is tax management. When I own an individual stock, I'm in control of a lot more in terms of if I own a mutual fund, that fund may decide that they want to sell some of the positions in their portfolio that are at a gain. And whether or not you want those realize capital gains, they will get distributed to you at each year end. So just on one level of practicality, the access portfolios gives us a little bit more tax control of a portfolio. The second value add, I'll call it, of an access portfolio is just the fact that a lot of our clients want to be generous. And when they do, they realize they can, they can not only give cash to the ministries or the nonprofits of their choice, they can also give assets in kind assets that have appreciated a value. And for, for details that I'll leave outside of this conversation, um, the access portfolio allows you to select winners at an even more granular basis, meaning I can pick the best performers within my basket of stocks um, rather than pick a basket of stocks that has mostly winners that have appreciated in value, 
but also contain some losers. I can leave out the losers and individually pick the companies that have best performed. So I'll leave those discussions for you to have with your advisor. Um, but those are just two things that I wanna highlight. And all of this can essentially be done within access portfolios with the same level of diversification and the same exposure. Because a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, hey, that sounds great, but guess what? I like mutual funds and I like index funds because they give me diversification. Well, the great news is the access portfolio buys all those underlying individual positions and allows you to maintain essentially the same diversification and allocation. So with that, Jerry, I want to take pretty much put myself on mute and give you the mic. Um, I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen. And I want to talk about this topic of corporate engagement. Um, I know it's something you're passionate about, but I want to start by reading a quote that you, you wrote actually last week uh, was issued by the World News Group. On April 12th, you said, Christians have been behind the curve about what's been going on in corporate politics, but they're catching up quickly. There are many tools at our disposal, such as voting on proxies, asking probing questions at annual meetings, and having conversations with investor relations. So Jerry, if you could just maybe before we get into corporate engagement, explain what you mean by saying, what are Christians behind the curve on? Yeah, that's a good question. By the way, uh, tomorrow, uh, World is uh, planning to run another piece from me, which talks specifically about direct indexing, which is what Access Portfolios is about. Because as I've written about this for World, a lot of people are writing to say, well, wait a minute, uh, I don't own the company. I own, you know, some, I own, you know, some particular asset manager. I own a mutual fund or I own an ETF. So how can I do it? And the answer is, well, you can't. Basically, yeah. I mean, that's the that's the that's the deal you made. Uh, you don't own this. You know, these are buckets of stock, and you don't own what's in the bucket. You own a share of the bucket, um, and you know they they own the stock, which means they own everything that the property right in the stock involves. Uh, you know, the right to resell, you know, capital gain, the dividends, and the right to vote. Um, on on proxies, on ballots, on members of the board of directors, on the auditor, and on various resolutions. So um, the idea, I know, I know we're going to get into this later, is you only have control of stocks that you actually own. All right, so what are they behind on? Well, what they're behind on is the fact that for something like 30 or 40 years, people who do not share the worldview of the majority of um, investors and probably a strong majority of people who are listening right now um, have been showing up at annual meetings, buying one share so they can show up and ask a question uh, and gradually kind of steering the conversation in a certain direction. And it's not a direction that honors the fundamental principle of the obligation of a publicly traded company to be a steward of the resources of the owners. You are a steward of the assets that God gave you, right? Well, when you invest in a company, they are stewards to you. So they're stewards to stewards. And they have, and you know, Paul says to the Corinthians, first of all, it is required of a steward that they be found faithful. Companies are morally and legally obligated to put the interest of shareholders first, which means not politics, not social issues, not social justice, not the planet, uh, not the cause of the month, not the thing that will get the CEO a plaque or an honorarium at a dinner or a legacy issue um, or you know positive headlines. They're required to put the interest of the investor above all others. And that has been undermined by the idea of stakeholder rather than shareholder capitalism, which, which demotes you to the same level as unions, suppliers, the planet, uh, and indigenous peoples, um, and um, the, you know any number of social causes, disenfranchised groups, et cetera. Now, of course, what that really means is that the CEO isn't really answering to anybody because if I answer to 20 
if I have a fiduciary obligation to 20 different interests, then I'm choosing at any given time which interest I'm going to serve. So what it really does is it transfers authority uh, to CEOs away from the one group that has the legal authority to hold them accountable. Uh, people have heard a lot about ESG, uh, uh, which is environmental, social, and governance investing. ESG is just one manifestation of this approach, which is that you should be investing um, either screening out uh, or if you're not screening out companies, owning them, but voting for and promoting things in addition to the financial interest of shareholders, uh, which tends to largely be political issues that are generally not core for the business. What we're behind on is that this has been going on and we haven't been, been paying attention. And I think to a large degree, Christians have thought of large corporations as neutral territory or even positive friendly territory for our set of values. Um, and we've entrusted our money our, we've entrusted our children to entertainment companies built on wholesome images, uh, built on pro-family wholesome images that in fact, essentially have been, if not ideologically captured um, internally, at least giving in to activist groups from outside. Um, and um, I think Christians have now awakened to that. You know, I think that, um, you know, a particular magical company a couple of years ago, a uh, large entertainment conglomerate, shocked many Christians by taking positions on issues regarding transgender rights, et cetera, that were, were shocking. I, I don't think it's shocking to people who've been following the progress of this movement of stakeholder capitalism and the politicization of companies. So we've been behind. And so that's a problem. The other problem is when we were trying to catch up by disengaging rather than engaging. In other words, we keep expanding the list of companies that we want to sell because we don't want to have anything to do with them because we see them as being hostile to our worldview. And ironically, by doing that, we are diminishing our influence or at least diminishing our opportunity for influence. Uh, if I don't like what's going on in my country or in my state or in my county or in my little borough here that I live in, uh, it, it, I, 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 I don't think the natural thing is for me to call the Department of Elections and say, remove me from the voter rolls. You know, uh, I don't want to be a registered voter anymore. I'm done. I would, I would understand that I'm giving up the opportunity to influence things in the right direction. And I would instead, what I should be doing is saying, I'm going to show up for all the elections, not just general elections, but primaries. And I'm going to show up for the, uh, you know, the odd year elections. And I'm, 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 I'm going to vote for county commissioners and, and all the rest of it. But if some, for some reason, when it comes to corporate politics, our reaction is automatically, who is on the list of companies that I won't own, which is, we don't quite realize it, who is on the list of companies that I am selling my ability to have a direct influence on? And I think the reason we don't realize it is because most of us don't know that we had that authority to begin with. I can tell you that people who do not share your worldview do know about this, are highly skilled and extremely organized um, and have been punching above their weight class uh, for a long time in influencing these companies in the right direction. So we, we were behind, we didn't know what was going on. Then we had a shock in realizing how far corporate America uh, had gone. Uh, and anyone who's following the controversies over certain beer companies uh, over the past few weeks and some branding decisions, which are pretty shocking, you know, for beer, which is a pretty kind of middle America. And I know some people, some people want to screen that out and you're welcome to, that's up to your conscience, but not everybody screens it out of their portfolio or of their life. Um, um, and to see some of the branding decisions that have been made there are just, you know, pretty shocking. Um, so the answer is when something's like that, to engage. Um, I think that Jesus is kind of quasi parable of being salt and light of, you know, the kingdom being salt implied in that is everything that doesn't have salt applied to it is always rotting. So a rotting has been taking place. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised by that, but the answer is to be salt and light. I think just you've made a lot of good points there. And I think just for the benefit of our listeners too, 
Um, it could be even helpful to just start from, you, you kind of hit on this a little bit, but I think a lot of investors don't even know that they have the right to vote. So maybe let's define words like proxy. Um, proxy is essentially, Jerry, what? How would you define it in, in a sentence or two? Um, I think a great analogy is that pretty much everything, every right that you have as a citizen in America um, of, a, of political entities has a similar right when it comes to being a shareholder. Um, now, there's some shares that are non-voting, but that's, the, that's a small minority, right? So basically, let's kind of go through what, can, what rights do you have as a citizen? Uh, as a citizen, you have a right to vote. Well, okay. And that happens in elections. And those elections are held twice a year, sometimes more. There are things called special elections, but let's keep it simple. Well, publicly traded companies have an annual election. Uh, they don't vote, you don't vote for Congress, but you vote for a little mini Congress, the board of directors. Uh, and you and, and not only do you vote on who gets elected to the little mini Congresses that run these, uh, but you also get to vote on individual questions, almost like initiative or referendum questions. Some states have initiative and referendum. Shall we support the borrowing of money for this bond? Or what should, you know, California had a referendum on whether marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, we've had referenda recently on abortion rights, for instance, in Kentucky. So issues are put before voters and, well, issues are put before shareholders. So you have a right to vote on these. And just like you go down to the elect, uh, you know, election, um, your election site, and there's a little ballot there. Well, in corporation world, those are called proxies. So there's a proxy card and you can vote on those. It's not as easy. It's not designed to be easy, which is precisely why we build out an infrastructure so that we learned how to do it. Because frankly, the reason that almost no investors vote is because it's not as easy as going down to your, your, your local polling station. Oh. So, so that's so you can do that. What else can you do? Uh, you can call your city council or borough council or county commissioner or your or your congressperson. Well, you can do the same thing with corporations. You can call investor relations or send them an email saying, I'm an owner and I'm concerned about a decision. I, you know, I just heard the CEO say that sounded like he said, I'm going to divest from any state that has pro-life laws. How is that in the interest of shareholders? Why is that any business of a company that's supposed to be in the business of providing software for sales functions? And you can have those conversations. Just like you can go to your town council meeting and say, excuse me, I have a question. You know, why don't we have a stoplight at that dangerous intersection? You can go there and you can say, I have a question. Why are we weighing in on abortion politics? Or why are we weighing in on trans surgery? Or why are we weighing in on whether kindergartners should be you know, taught they might be gender fluid? Or why are we taking positions uh, on issues that aren't core issues? You know, for instance, like decarbonization. You can ask those questions at the town hall meeting that's held. Um, so these are things you can do. By the way, you don't even have to give your name for these things. All of the things that I've mentioned already can be done anonymously. Um, just, like you're, just like your vote is confidential, you know, uh, in elections. Uh, so for the most part, votes are confidential in the corporate world. So I think, too, just to kind of lay out what I'll call the problem here is when I own a mutual fund or an index fund, I don't necessarily get to vote my my proxies. In fact, I don't get to. Right. My, my proxy is basically harvested by the mutual fund manager, company, whatever you want to call it. And so um, I think that's news to a lot of people. People don't know that. Um, but I also want to say, too, if I'm listening right now, I'm thinking, you know, I can't, you can't expect me to show up to these. I have a full-time job. I have a family. I have ministry, work endeavors, things like that. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I can, I am hearing all these things and I'm just feeling like utter defeat. So I think where maybe it'd be helpful for you to kind of touch on is um, through the access portfolio, I'm holding individual stock positions. And now I basically don't have some fund company whose ideas I either don't know or don't agree with now harvesting my ballots. So what's so then I feel like my only option is if I don't have the access portfolio, okay, well, then I just don't want to own that company. But you touched on this a little bit. There's sort of a third way. It's not, oh, I have to hold and not, I can't speak. 
or I just have to divest and essentially not buy, I have to sell. Um, maybe talk a little bit more about the idea of corporate engagement um, and essentially the tools that you guys are using under the access portfolios to exercise your rights as a shareholder. Yeah, so if you're in access portfolios, then the voting is being done for you. It's a complicated system. Like I said, it is not designed to be easy. Um, and we've had to learn how to do it. And frankly, I'm not a bureaucratic person. You know, I'm not a hall monitor personality type. So I didn't really like learning all those rules, but we had to, right, in order to, you know, be able to, to do that. Uh, so, you know, we, when you're working with access, access portfolios, you're getting the voting. Um, and I can tell you what you're getting because we're heavily involved in that process. I mean, access portfolios is doing that, but we are operationally, you know, a big part of that. So, you know, I can, I can, you know, give you an idea of kind of how that voting is occurring and what principles are being followed. And there's documentation on the principles and there's transparency on how you're voting. Access portfolios is not trying to hide from you how they're voting. It's a value add, not a harvest your vote to assuage an interest group and kind of keep the, you know, the investors kind of in the dark about it. But in addition to that, you can say, I want more. Uh, so I want, for instance, Boyer Research to do more than help with the voting process. I want them to log on to the annual meeting. I want them to talk to investor relations. Um, I want them to have phone calls with these people. I want them to maybe even put proposals on the ballot um, because largely proxy voting to the degree that we're involved. In the past, proxy voting is us, is a lot of bad ideas on the ballot and us not voting. Now we're waking up and it's us voting no on bad ideas. The next phase is to get them to vote no on our good ideas, right? Uh, to set the agenda with our own proposals. And of course, what we really want to get is to get people voting yes on good ideas, but you know, there's a patience to this. Um, so let's kind of focus in on sort of the lower hanging fruit, which is just having conversations uh, with these companies. Uh, now, if they don't want to talk, there's ways to get them to talk. Like for instance, if you own a certain number of shares, you can put a proposal on the ballot. Uh, so there's a financial advisor, you might've seen an article in the Wall Street Journal recently, uh, who we helped put a proposal on the ballot for the largest bank in America, or you can argue about which is the largest, but arguably the largest bank in, the, in America, which certainly appears to have been biased in canceling the accounts of conservative Christians. For example, Ambassador Sam Brownback started a religious liberty organization, uh, set up an account with this bank, and then was canceled. And they were not able to give a satisfactory explanation to him or to us. So we worked with an advisor who owned enough shares, and now there's a proposal on the ballot. And the company said, well, we don't think this proposal belongs on the ballot. Uh, we, think, we think it's ordinary business, as if religious liberty and civil liberties and freedom of conscience are just ordinary management business. And they told the SEC, we don't intend to put this on the ballot. And the SEC said, no, we cannot support your position. So it's on the ballot. So now there's, now there's going to be a presentation at that company's annual meeting shortly. So that's a setting of the agenda and able to get in there and begin to uh, debate those issues. So at that point, you know, they are essentially are forced to have to engage with us. And the thing is, I think our arguments are better. So I think getting in the room makes a big difference. So if there's 200 people attending an annual meeting um, and one or two of us show up, you know, that's, that's not a 1% difference in the dynamics, that's a 30 or 40% difference because there's now a debate. Um, and if we're putting proposals on the ballot, now we're deciding what's debated. Um, now, if somebody's doing that, they have to use their name. There's some things you can do anonymously or with a high probability of anonymity. And there's some things that you have to use your name and those kinds of approaches, you have to use your name. There's another tool where, you know, you probably like maybe ministries, you know, have done amicus briefs you know, like if, if the, you know, the lawsuit about Roe versus Wade, and then maybe Family Research Council or some other group, you know, weighs in with the court saying, we're not a plaintiff or a defendant, but we think you should overturn Roe versus Wade. This, there's a similar tool available when it comes to these corporate 
um, proxies where somebody can come forward and say, we didn't put the, we're not, we didn't put it on the ballot, but we think that XYZ company should be transparent about debanking and whether it uses religious or political criterion. Or we think that this company should, we, we think that shareholders should vote against this pro-abortion resolution. Uh, there's a, I would say a soft drink company, you know, some of the largest soft drink companies over the next couple of weeks are going to have several proposals on the ballot, which are, you know, thinly veiled attempts to get these companies to come down in favor of abortion rights. Um, are, are we on those? I can tell you historically, the proxy services, so the kind of the, uh, most of the voting is done at the recommendation of proxy services, have been supporting those resolutions, which means that a lot of mutual funds and ETFs have also been voting in support of those resolutions. You might have voted in favor of, of such resolutions, uh, or it was done because someone harvested your ballot. Now, here's a nice little victory story. Um, we've had for a couple of years, we've had conversations with the largest of these proxy services, uh, and they switched their position this year and now are recommending no votes on these pro-abortion resolutions. And we've noticed there have been, there's been one of them so far this year. Last year, those things were getting 30 and 40 percent support. Uh, this year, they're getting something like 15 percent support. So it's really made a difference. So, you know, there is an opportunity to have uh, an impact. Yeah, and I think we're just scratching the surface. What I want to give kind of attendees a flavor of is there's varying degrees of involvement, right? Because not everyone is called to be the first over the wall. And 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 many of our clients, I think, would probably identify with that. They, you know, I think a lot of evangelical Christians or just the greater Christian church has always been dubbed the kind of the silent majority. And so we can maintain the ability to support those who are first over the wall without being it. And that's kind of some of these lesser things, but we also have the ability through these strategies to go as far as they want, which is kind of goes back to the spirit of how I opened it was we want to enable conviction, right? For our clients to develop those convictions, because I don't know what God has laid on their heart, but maybe there's a client who feels really passionate about it and they can work with Boyer Research Group or another sub-advisor under the access portfolio model that allows them to essentially be take back their voice and their vote. So, um, so we don't mind being kind of first over the wall. So for instance, let's say someone opts into this, right? So I can I can talk to a company and I can say, listen, I'm speaking on behalf of a group of concerned shareholders. Who are they? That's not your concern right now. I, but, I, but the more people are in this, I can say, but they do represent this XYZ number of shares, I, you know, this, this many number of shares. So substantial number of shareholders, or I'm representing 100 shareholders, uh, and they're concerned about this. Um, and, um, you know, we might end up putting a proposal on the ballot. But before that, you know, let's have a conversation about it. Now they they're they're hearing from me. They're not they they know my name. They don't know your name. Um, uh, so that's there's a so most of the things that that would be involved are things where your name isn't known. Anytime that anybody so if somebody signs up for this contractually, I can't tell anybody their name. Right, um, I'm contractually obligated to keep them anonymous. Uh, however, if somebody wants to do more. That's fine. They can opt in. What, the, what probably most people are, want to do, are going to do is say, oh, I heard about that proposal in front of the big bank. Someone already is in the lead on that. But can I put, a, you know, can I sign something saying I support this too? Okay, yes, you can, but that, it'll have your name on it. Are you okay with that? Well, I don't know. Let me think about it. Let me pray about it. Uh, so it's really, they're really in control of that process. That's great. And I, I think that's what I want to emphasize is I'll call it control. And because the access portfolios, again, it's just giving our clients and advisors greater access. And it starts with just how the portfolio is designed. Instead of a fund company investing a bunch of funds that get my votes, now I'm essentially a shareholder in those corporations. And then once I've done that, I can choose to opt in to Boyer Research Group or or whoever that can on my behalf essentially go before these organizations. So 
there's probably a lot that we're opening up that quite frankly needs to be discussed between the client and the advisor. Today's call was simply to just to give them a flavor of what's been happening, which is not really engagement. It's been kind of more of a fleeing away from to help them understand that there is a third way where they can engage and to give them an idea of what that looks like. And I think um, it's nice to know that it's actually working, right? We could talk about these ideas and say, yeah, we're trying to talk to these corporations. We're knocking on doors. We're sending emails. We're going to meetings. It's another thing to actually have it be effective. And, and that's what we're seeing, which is really exciting because I think it's giving people their voice. So um, Jerry, am I leaving anything out? I want to leave time for questions. And, and Colby, you might have noticed I might have missed something that we should clarify. But Jerry, before we kind of go to Q&A, maybe um, anything that you would add to the conversation? Yeah, I think probably if I'm putting myself in the uh, position of someone listening right now or kind of the, the questions that normally come after, it is, well, wait a minute. Um, how do I know I can trust you? Right. You're telling me that these large asset managers don't share my worldview, et cetera. How do I know I can trust you? And the answer is you don't and you don't have to. Um, transparency deals with that issue. Right. So um, when you're involved with access portfolios and including with Boyer Research Engagement, we're reporting to you. But I, I think that's probably not enough. I think what you need to understand is exactly what the approach is. Because I think, I mean, there's 700 topics that appear in any given, you know, year. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to grind through that detail. I grind through that detail. So what you really need to know is what are you buying into, in terms of the philosophy. What you're buying into is shareholder primacy. You're buying into the idea that business should be focused on business and stay out of non-core political issues. Yes, a retail company certainly should be involved with issues having to do with sales taxes. I talked to a large retailer that had been banning some books that were skeptical about transitional surgery for minors. You know, there's a book that said, you know, children shouldn't get sex reassignment surgery. They banned that book. And we talked to them, you know, they didn't say, they wouldn't sell that book anymore. We talked to them about their polit politicization and they started talking about land use issues and you know property taxes it's like of course you should be talking you should be dealing with local government on property taxes that's a core issue for you you're a retail chain trans surgery books you know curating content no not not your lane so you're buying into that you're buying into depoliticization you're buying into the idea that every decision should ask the question what is best for the shareholder um uh and we can do, you can take the wealth from that, you can take your dividends or whatever, and you can address social causes through your charitable giving or through your volunteer work. That's not the job of those companies. Um, so that's basically, essentially, that's the underlying philosophy. Uh, and that includes transparency. There's no reason a corporation should be giving money to Planned Parenthood. And they do it and they hide it by not... I mean, they're killing future customers. There's no business in the world other than Planned Parenthood, I think, that benefits uh, from having fewer customers in the world. But corporations do it and they hide it. They don't have, they don't have charitable contribution disclosure. So we want disclosure. It's, it's shareholder money. So I think you, you, you understand what you're, what you're getting into philosophically. Um, and if you're aligned with that, then this is something you'd be more interested in. And if you're not, then you won't like this many shareholders who think that shareholders should be dropped down uh, in priority. And I don't know many citizens, new polling indicates that Republicans and Democrats both think that corporations, this is new Wall Street Journal polling from last week, both think that corporations should stay out of divisive social issues. I think too, um, that's, I'm glad you added that point. Um, Actually, I'll save this for the q and I think someone's got, got a question, um, but um, Colby, you wanna jump on it? Is there anything that you would add or that you wanna to touch on before we move to Q&A? Yeah, Jerry, I'd like to know, um, I think we mentioned this earlier on, of how do we actually engage as corporations winsomely? And I've heard you mention it, hey, we come with a redemptive perspective. Now, how does that work when we live in such a polarized time where we might say we should just come in as hot and on fire as another side 
how are you actually showing up with winsome uh, or being winsome in these convictions or what you would say redemptive? Well, we always start with telling them that we like them. Um, it, you know, we wouldn't be invested in them if we didn't think there was something great there. Um, so for instance, I, I just mentioned a bank. That bank that you know I have in mind just had a great earnings quarter, right? And so, you know, I haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna pop in when I mean, we've been wrestling with that bank about debanking, but we're gonna go back and say, wow. Thanks for delivering great earnings. It was a tough environment. So there's always, we always say, like there's another very large retail chain that we thought was getting a little too political. But the first five minutes of the conversation is you are one of the best run institutions in the world. Um, you're incredibly productive. In fact, that's all the more reason we want you to stick to that. You're, you're so good at running a highly efficient, low cost retail chain. Why in the world would you, you, uh, you, would you kind of double like moonlight as a political action committee? You don't need to be a PAC or a 527 group or a think tank or an activist group. You're an incredible business entity. So we, you know, if, 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 if someone's invested in them, it means that there's something of value there. So we always start with that shared ground and then steer them back to what we think their calling is. Also, we always start with the presumption until they prove otherwise, that they're open-minded, that this is a persuasion situation. Uh, we tell them we're not trying to trip them up because we're not. And we also understand, and a lot of conservative rhetoric has taken a hostile attitude towards business. And I think that's wrong because the vast majority of companies we're talking to are not really interested in following the agenda that they're following. But they, the other side showed up and grabbed them by the nose and pulled them. So they, I mean, at worst, their sin was accommodation to somebody else's agenda. It was a, maybe a lack of backbone, but very few of these CEOs or managers are interested in saving the world through social justice. There's a few, but I can tell you that, you know, um, a certain gigantic um, media conglomerate and theme park company, yeah, I sat in on the annual meeting. At the beginning of that annual meeting, the CEO did not want to weigh in on legislation about whether kindergartners should be discussing gender fluidity. By the end, just relentlessly pounded from one side, the company came down on, you know, came down on that issue. Most of them are reluctant. There's a few there, they drank the Kool-Aid, but most of them didn't. And we should stop assuming that because they're acting badly, that they're acting badly because they're thinking badly. Maybe we need to stop and say, maybe they're acting badly because we didn't help. Maybe our maybe the most significant fact in corporate America was our absence, not their accommodation that eventually, you know, the C, uh, you know, CEO, it's hard for CEO. I, I know one particular CEO is an evangelical Christian, was involved in one of these hot button issues. He said, you know, I heard, for, you know, some, someone who knows him, he said, everybody was against me. I, I, you know, I had to cave in. Now, maybe this person could have resigned, but maybe that, you know, he didn't see that as an option. And so he caved in on a kind of a gender issue because the board was against him and the activists were against him and the employee groups, only of course, the hyper-organized ones were against them. So I don't know, maybe it's more us than them. Uh, so if we start off with the assumption, hey, sorry, we haven't been part of the conversation. Uh, we want to help you. Uh, next time you're thinking, thinking about a streaming service that had a movie that had nine-year-old girls doing pole dancing, and they were promoting that movie. Uh, I didn't watch the movie, but I saw the trailer. Um, hey, how can we help you? That completely blew up in your face. How can we help you next time have somebody in the room? Like one Midwestern Christian mom anywhere in the vicinity of that would have shut that down in a moment, but they didn't have anybody like that. Uh, so how can we help you kind of understand how people are gonna to react to what you're doing? So we start off with the assumption you're a great company, that's why you're invested. We start off with the assumption you're just trying to do your job, you're getting pulled around. And we're starting off with the assumption that the main problem was that we haven't been there to be an influence um, and not a lot of blaming. I think, too, you said some things that I thought were were good. Um, 
one of the things I wanted to clarify on the access portfolios, you know, our clients do have the freedom to screen out certain positions. So, and this is where I think we want to enable, again, those convictions of our clients and not, not speak for them on their behalf. So for all those of you who are listening, you're saying, wow, you know, they're, you know, it's, this sounds nice, but I just really believe that we just, the best thing to do is not to hold that position. If that's what you believe, then you and your advisor could actually work together. And because you own individual stocks and not a basket of stocks or a bucket like Jerry's approach is, you can say, hey, I don't want that position. I, I don't even want to engage with them. That's an option too. So, um, but what I really appreciated about what you said is um, just think about it in terms of how the church views missions. We talk about wanting to go to unengaged and unreached people groups. Well, in a way, this is just another unengaged people group, right? And I would say Proxy World is an unreached people group. I've had so many conversations with these people, the DEI departments, the proxy services. They have never heard these arguments, ever. And I, I always ask them, has anyone ever said this to you before? No. Has anyone ever talked to you about viewpoint diversity? What's viewpoint diversity? You know, we have diversity. We have all the diversity. I remember talking to, uh, this is um, a glass company. Um, oh, we have the diversity. We have all the letters. L, G, B, T, Q, and she stopped for a moment. Am I missing any letters? You know, because I don't want to miss any letters. Who knows what will happen? And I said, what about C? And she said, what's C? I said, C is Christian. Well, I think we have that. No, you don't. It's not on your website. It's not in your diversity statement. You have nothing about religious diversity. You don't even have somebody in a burqa. You know, I mean, usually if a company does religious diversity, it's a burqa. It's almost never you know, like prayer, you know, it's almost never someone coming out of church. You don't even have that. You, it is completely unaddressed. So you don't have, and what's viewpoint diversity? The viewpoint diversity is somebody who's, um, who has a, who say doesn't agree with same-sex marriage, um, you know, can't come in Monday morning to a pink slip because you're protecting. Um, I mean, it took a while with the proxy service for them to even find if they had a code in their database, you know, to even know how to vote on these things. It's an unreached people group and unreached people group. When you go to unreached people group, there's great upside. You can also get a spear through the heart uh, with unreached people groups. I don't mean to laugh about that. It's just, that's the reality of it. I mean, you can get, you, there can be a lot of hostility, um, you know, and we, you know, I catch some of that, but, you know, I understand they don't really know. They don't understand. Um, and there's a time when I didn't know or understand um, and, and hit back at people who tried to speak to me about the truth. So, uh, I think the unreached people group is a great analogy. Uh, so we don't just say things are so terrible in, in this Island, you know, it's so bad. So we're not going to send anybody, but that's what we do with corporations. Things are so bad that we're not going to send anybody to which I'd say, go, go back and read the book of Jonah. Uh, John, I think Jonah is the manual for corporate engagement. Okay, well, we can always definitely go back to the word and appreciate you bringing that up. Um, want to give some time for some questions and be respectful of everyone's time today. Um, but before we get to that last piece, I just want to say, ultimately, I think if you're thinking, hey, you've piqued my interest, I want to learn more, or <laughs> maybe you have additional thoughts, um, I'm going to encourage you to, to, to reach out to your advisor because that's the person who knows your situation best. Access portfolios aren't for everyone. It's not for every account size, um, but it's an option that we think is going to be more and more of a compelling option. Aside from this whole corporate engagement that we've talked about for the last 50 minutes or so, um, there's tax advantages, there's giving opportunities. Um, there's plenty of reasons why someone should consider owning individual stocks. We think one of them is that they, they can engage. Um, but at the very least, have a conversation with your advisor to see if it makes sense for you. Um, and uh, that's it. I wanna go to the kind of a Q&A time with our last few minutes here. Um, starting with a question that I had um, from someone. It said, it's great to hear about all the negative things uh, that you're hitting against, but um, what are you doing to positive? Are you finding allies out there? Are you positively reinforcing? Rather than just saying, don't do this, don't do that. So um, I think someone was just trying to figure out, are you fighting both sides of the, the battle? 
Uh, last, um, if, if um, we do a monthly or things got busy, so this time it was bi-monthly engagement report. The most recent one you'll see, you'll see that we did some, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 emails that were negative and 700 emails that were positive, uh, specifically on the is issue of abortion. We sent um, emails to every company that we have the email address for or a contact that is owned by somebody who is has opted into corp who's in access portfolios and opted into corporate engagement. Because that's a separate step. If you're in access portfolios, it's not automatic to get corporate engagement. You have to say, I want that. Um, it's, well, everybody, every company that did not come out and say something uh, negative about um, the overturn of Roe versus Wade, we thank them for staying out of that issue. Um, now, you could ask, well, what about companies that came out in favor of the overturn? I don't know any that did. If we did, it would have been maybe a double attaboy. But, you know, um, so overwhelmingly, that was most of our communications, you know, by a factor of 14, I think, of, my math is right, uh, were positive communications. Um, so, oh, another is um, very large oil company um, where I helped a, 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 a um, uh, shareholder who's a, a um, in, was also a, a financial advisor, put a proposal on the ballot. They, they welcomed it onto the ballot. Usually companies, they almost always oppose these. But what's been put on the on the ballots of these um, oil companies is we want you to do a study of the risks of essentially of being in the oil business. We want you to do a study of the risks of global warming because you're in the fossil fuel business. But none of the studies ever say what would be the risk of getting out of the oil business. It's not a cost benefit analysis. It's just a cost cost analysis. So and of course the companies come back and say well there are benefits. To being in the oil business too, but the shareholders, the, the proposals coming from the activists don't invite them to do this. So we've invited them to do an analysis which says, what would be the financial effect of getting out of oil and gas? And they said, you know, we're not going to fight that. We want that proposal on the ballot. Uh, so that's a constructive relationship that we have with one of the largest companies in the world. Um, also, the thing we're moving into is like these amicus briefs that I mentioned. That's not what they're actually called, but they have like a legal technical name. A lot of those are going to be aligned with management because most of the proposals on the ballot from shareholders are coming from people who have a different worldview than most of us here. They're mostly all coming from one side. So mostly we're going to be siding with management against activists who are pulling too far. Um, and that's like that's probably the biggest growth area for us will be that these companies that have tried to say, yes, we're, yes, we believe in equality. Yes, we believe in that. And then these activists come back and say, oh, you said you believe in equality, just so you understand that includes abortion. Well, wait a minute. No, that's not what we meant when we, were, we said we're in favor of equality. We meant equality. Um, you know, uh, so I would say probably the fastest growing area for us is going to be siding with management against outside. And let me just tell one more story. I know we're running short of time, but we had a great thing that happened just a year before. This was this is about, about a year and a half ago, where we were sending out something that basically said, "Hey, companies, you know, we want you to stay out of politics. We want you to stay out of politics." And the, the ones that didn't respond, we followed up, and finally, one of them wrote back and said, "I'm sorry." Like we wrote and said, look, we're shareholders, you should respond. And he wrote back and he said, I'm sorry that we didn't respond. Everything that comes through my email account, you know, investor relations e email account is basically nonsense. This, if you heard the, sa the sound that you may have heard was my jaw hitting the desk when finally something came through the shareholder portal at investor relations, which had common sense to it. And we had a very constructive conversation with a Midwest lumber company who wanted to be a lumber company. That's the only engineering they wanted to do, not social engineering. Um, and so at the end of that was, hey, we're under pressure from these big asset managers. CEO said, I might not be here. And we said, we've got your back. If they come after you, you let us know because ordinary shareholders want you to stay focused on your business. Uh, so a lot of that's happened and I expect a lot more of that to happen. Mm -hmm.
You know, James uh, chapter three talks about wisdom and counsel that comes and is peaceable and gentle. Uh, it's not without conviction and without firmness, but it comes in a different way than worldly wisdom comes. So um, it sounds, when I hear you talk about that, a lot of that sounds, hey, you're, you're going a, a different way than is be, being pursued by the world. Um, and, and it's refreshing. And I'm sure it's obviously refreshing for those companies. So Jerry, in respect of everyone's time, I'm going to wrap us up. Um, for those attending, reach out to your advisors and stay in the loop on future events. You saw Colby's announcements that we're going to be doing a bunch of different things this year. And we're excited to have you join us along. So with that, thanks, everyone. Well, and Crystal, before we leave here, uh, uh, I, well, we had one panelist uh, guest bring up a topic here, um, a question. Jerry, this will be a good way to end it. And then you can say if this person wins their book or not. Um, they, they said, can I bring a topic I'm upset with a company about to the shareholder meeting through the access portfolios? And on top of that, if we have men and women seated at the corporate table, resigning is not the answer on hard issues. They need to fight and we need to help and support them. What is the best way to do that? I think that'd be a great way to summarize this conversation, Jerry. Well, if you talk to your advisor about an area of specific concern, the advisor can certainly reach out to me. And I, I suspect that, you know, it's probably something we're already working on. Uh, people at the corporate table, men and women, yeah, resigning is not the answer. Um, this is an area where we need to grow a lot, which is dealing with boards of directors. Let me tell you my dream. I have to stay focused. On, we're an execution operations company at Boyer Research, right? So this proxy stuff is complicated. So we're focused on that. But my dream is eventually out of this comes a feeder system for good members of the boards of directors uh, because these companies want good board members. They want ethnically diverse and gender diverse, but what they want are people who believe in business. They want entrepreneurs and people who understand the business mission. And I think there's a wonderful opportunity, so many board members retiring uh, to be a feeder system. Uh, so back the ones that are good, a lot of the best ones are retiring. Um, so we've got to deal with that issue, but that's also an opportunity. And don't make me choose, between, those are two good questions. Don't make me choose which one is best. Same you have two person. books, can you give, a, can you Three send, two books. I can give you a, an extra book if, if you. We'll, we'll send out both. Same person asked the question, but uh, they'll get two books. So the same person. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Take care, everyone.